Hey guys, so today I wanted to talk about the Rampart Street murders. This is a case that I wish I'd known about prior to my trip to New Orleans, and it's definitely something that I plan on visiting and taking a, d a deeper look into whenever I do go back, because I definitely plan on going back. Um, but I'll get right into it. So our two key players in this story are Zachary Bowen and Addie Hall. Now, Zach was a retired military veteran and it is suspected that he suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder and that this may have led to what inevitably happens in our story. Addie was a very free spirit. She was a bartender in New Orleans. They both were not originally from New Orleans but moved there um, just within a few years prior to Hurricane Katrina hitting. Now when Hurricane Katrina hit, a lot of people evacuated the city a forced mandatory evacuation was ev was eventually put on the city. However, a lot of people were unable to leave. Um, they either didn't have the means, didn't have the money, or simply had nowhere to go. Well, Addie and Zach didn't exactly fall under that. However, they chose to stay. They were living in the French Quarter at the time. The French Quarter did suffer some serious flood damage. Um, however, it was nothing like the Ninth Ward and everything that those people went through. Um, the French Quarter has historically sort of been protected because of its history. Um, they do everything that they can to protect the city from flooding, so that's a whole other um, controversy that a lot of people believe, and that's maybe a whole other video I could do. But Zach and Addie um, decided to stay in New Orleans and sort of push through. This wasn't uncommon. Um, a lot of people did choose to stay because they had had many, you know, false warnings of major hurricanes that, you know, came and passed and nothing happened. So some people did stay and Zach and Addie were two of those people. They met not long before um, the hurricane and they quickly fell in love. They decided to brave it out together and they sort of moved in with each other. Um, I don't think they were officially living together during the hurricane, but I think they were sort of just like camping out at one of their homes during it. But there was a lot of news coverage where you can actually see Zach and Addie outside um, on the stoop or in front of their stoop of their home in the French Quarter. During the hurricane, obviously, there wasn't electricity, uh, there wasn't running water a lot of places. You know, everybody that was still there had to really make do and had to sort of scramble together to survive. Um, Zach and Addie very famously would sit outside, almost like dressed up. Um, I wouldn't say Mardi Gras type, but you know, like she, there's a very famous picture of her. I believe she has like star glasses on or heart sunglasses on or something. They would sit out front with drinks, whatever food they had, and people would come by and especially at night and stuff, they would have little sort of cookouts, you know, impromptu. People would bring what they had. They would give what they had. Everybody sort of collected together. And the feeling that Zach and Addie had during this time was that the French Quarter really belonged to them. It was their sort of solitude. Nobody was there. It was their own little world and they very quickly fell deeply in love in this little secluded world of theirs. Now the problem is that after the flooding subsided, after normalcy sort of came back into the quarter, after everyone came back, you know, life went back to the usual nine to five, everyone going to work, Addie had to go back to bartending. Zach had a few different jobs. I know one of them was uh, delivering for a grocery store in the quarter. And it seems like the depression of real life sort of really hit them. They started to have problems with each other, started to have fights with each other. I think it was more so um, everything kind of going back and them not wanting to leave this fantasy life that they were able to live for a while. And I think they really took it out on each other. Um, people around Zach and Addie both started to notice. Now Zach was, I believe, still married at the time of their relationship, but he'd been long separated from his wife, and they seemed to have a semi-healthy relationship. Um, the only thing that I've seen of her, and you can see her in, there's a famous doc documentary, I think it was called Zach and Addie, there was a couple documentaries that I watched, and I'll try and remember to link those below. But in one, his wife is speaking, and they had children together, and it seemed that her only issue with Zach was that he didn't go see the kids enough. He was sort of living this younger lifestyle out there, and um, I guess living up the youth that he felt he never had, maybe because of his military service, maybe because he had kids, you know. There's a million reasons, it seems, behind Zach's choices. But overall, he wasn't a bad guy, according to his wife, and he loved his children, his children adored him. But, you know, after everything sort of went back to normal again, 
um, his wife was upset with him in the first place because they couldn't get a hold of him during the flood. They really thought something serious had happened to him and she was afraid that she was gonna have to tell her kids that their dad was dead. His mother didn't hear from him, nobody heard from him. When they finally saw them or heard from Zach, it was seeing them on the news coverage. Um, so they all kind of found that odd that he was there with some younger girl and sort of forgetting his real life and you know, whatever, maybe it's just communication issues because of the flooding. Well, when everything went back to normal, his wife noticed some oddities. His friends noticed some weird things. Addie's um, co-workers and bosses at the bar noticed things. Um, they noticed that the two were acting strange. They noticed that they would come in exhausted the next day after a really bad fight. Um, Addie would go to work with bruises and say that they were drunk and Zach had hit her and they were just having horrible, horrible fights. It was not a healthy relationship anymore. And people around them, you know, gave what advice they could, but they were obviously still in love with each other. They wanted to make it work. They moved into an apartment located at 826 North Rampart Street. And this is the location of the infamous murder that we will talk about. 826 North Rampart, um, they lived in the apartment above a voodoo spiritual temple. And this is on the edge of the French Quarter. Um, a lot of people suspect that because they lived over this voodoo temple, that's why this horrific thing occurred. Um, however, the voodoo temple that's there is not known for being um, into, I guess, what you would call like dark magic or anything like that. It's more of a positive temple. So if you do believe in that stuff, it certainly wasn't one um, that encouraged any kind of, you know, sacrifice or crime or anything like that. So take what you will of that. <clears throat> moving into the rampart street apartment was their fresh start um they really thought that they could sort of let the past go um move forward with their relationship grow closer and stronger together however from the get-go there was already issues um in one of the documentaries that i watched it actually discussed how even though they were getting this apartment together Addie was constantly contacting the landlord and asking that only her name be added to everything. So it seems she didn't really trust Zach, and I'm sure there's definitely reason for that. But rather than really giving a fresh start, she was still suspicious and she looked out for herself above him. This seems to um, have ignited some issues with him, understandably, but not to the point that it, he took it. Even after moving into the Rampart Street home, um, they continued fighting. Zach was very jealous of Addie as she was a bartender and a very good one at that. So she often flirted with guys, you know, that came to drink and would tip her well and everything. But um, she actually accused him of being um, unfaithful to her. So it didn't really give them the fresh start that they were looking for, to, to say the least. Now, one day, Addie stopped showing up to work. She bartended at a popular bar called the Spotted Cat and Zach actually fell into a really destructive pattern of drinking and drugs and infidelity. And unfortunately only weeks after moving into the Rampart Street home, Zach committed suicide. And now we get into the horrific death of Addie Hall and Zachary Bowen. Zachary was 28 years old at the time of his death and Addie was 30. Um, on October 17, 2006, police were called to 621 St. Louis Street, which is the Omni Royal Hotel. Um, they were called because of reports of a body falling from the Omni Hotel garage and landing on the fourth floor roof of the hotel maintenance area. At 8.41 p.m., an ambulance arrived to assess the body, and they pronounced Zachary dead at 8.52 p.m. Now, when they found Zachary's body, he was lying on his back with apparent cigarette burns all over his abdomen and body. In his right front pocket, they found a little plastic baggie that contained a set of keys and a note that was addressed to police. And when they opened up the note, this is what it read. This was not accidental. I had to take my own life to pay for the one I took. If you go to 826 North Rampart, you will find the dismembered corpse of my girlfriend, Addie, in the oven, on the stove, and in the fridge, along with full documentation on the both of us and a full signed confession from myself. The keys in my right front pocket are for the gates. And then he gives the contact information for his landlord, the phone number and everything, and tells them to contact him as the landlord will let them in. Zach's body was taken to the Orleans Parish Coroner's Office 
and police went to the landlord's location and asked him for access to Zach and Addie's apartment. The landlord led them in and this is what they found. According to the police report, the apartment was cluttered with garbage and in complete disarray and silver colored spray paint on the living room walls and this is a theme throughout the apartment. Um, almost every room they go into there will be silver, silver spray paint um, basically pointing them somewhere. Um, but on the living room walls were the following words. Look in the oven. Total failure. I loved her. Call blank at blank or blank. And that was his wife at the time. And he was giving two phone numbers on uh, where to call her. Entering the bedroom, which was also cluttered with junk, um, the following was also sprayed onto the walls. Help me stop the pain. When the police walked into the kitchen, there was writing again in silver paint on the stove that said, don't look. The, there was a white colored pot on the back burner containing hands and feet in a white congealed liquid. In a chrome colored pot was the charred remains of a human head. Inside the oven were two trays. The top tray contained remains of human claves and arms, and the bottom tray contained the remains of human thighs. Inside the refrigerator, there were two trash bags, one black and one white. The white bag contained a saw, shaving cream, human hair, and cleaning products, and the black bag contained a female torso. Entering the bathroom, more silver spray paint was on the wall. On the mirror, it read, don't look, with arrows pointing to the tub. On the back of the wall of the tub was painted, I'm sorry, I couldn't finish. Located on a coffee table in the living room was an open diary with police marked on it. The journal read as follows. Well, let's see. Today is Monday, October 16th at 2 a.m. I killed her at 1 a.m. Thursday, the 5th of October. She had stolen this apartment from me. Ask blank the landlord. He'll explain that one. Tried to kick me out, then would not shut the fuck up. So I very calmly strangled her. It was very quick. Then, after sexually defiling the body a few times, I was posed with the question of how to dispose of the corpse. So I got drunker and passed out next to her on this very futon. The next morning I woke up, went to work at Metasis, and he gives his work address, and worked till 9 p.m. During the day, I figured I should dismember the body, cook the pieces to ease the separation of flesh from the bone, and gradually dispose of the meat with various ways. I'd save the bones. So I came home, moved the body to the tub, got a saw and hacked off her feet, hands, and head. Put her in the oven after giving it an awful haircut and her feet and hands in water on the range. Then I got drunker and some hours later turned off the stove, filled the tub with water, and passed out. I was to be off all weekend, so I had plenty of time to work. Out due to laziness, spent most of that time coked up in different bars with different girls. Sunday night, I sawed off the rest of the legs and arms and put them in the oven and passed out. I came to some seven hours later with an awful smell emanating from the kitchen. I turned off the oven and went to work Monday. This would be the last day I would work. Monday after work, I came home and set to work on the torso. Halfway through that task, I stopped and thought about what I was doing. The decision to halt the first idea and move to plan B, the crime scene you're in now, came after a while. I scarred myself, not by the action of calmly strangling the woman whom I've loved for one and a half years and then dissecting her body, but by my entire lack of remorse. I've known forever how horrible of a person I am, ask anyone, and decided to quit my jobs and spend the $1,500 in cash I had being happy until I killed myself. So that's what I did. Good food, good drugs, good strippers, good friends, and any loose ends I may have had. I didn't contact any family, so that will explain the shock, and had a fantastic time living out my days. Fuck it all, and fucking no regrets. It's just about time now. The only numbers left in this phone are of my close friends and family members, so go to work. There's then a list of words at the end of this journal entry. Failures. School, friends, military, marriage, 
parenthood, morals, love. Every last one of these I failed at, hence the 28 cigarette burns, one for each failed year of my existence. So after seeing all the evidence, seeing the fully written confession um, by Zach of killing Addie and exactly what he did, and comparing it to the scene and seeing that everything was accurate, um, the case was closed. Zachary was listed as a suicide and Addie was unfortunately listed as a homicide. Um, since then, the voodoo shop below their apartment had an electrical fire, so it has been closed. However, a lot of people are saying that they have um, witnessed some paranormal activity in the apartment or in the voodoo shop that they think is related to Zach and Addie. I can't speak on this. I don't know anything of, of it. Um, I know BuzzFeed Unsolved did something there not that long ago, I don't think. And it was an interesting video if you're into voodoo or if you're into anything paranormal. Um, but as far as the facts go, this is the story of the Rampart Street murders of Zachary Bowen and Addie Hall. So I hope you guys liked this. It was a very gruesome story, but it was really interesting to read the police reports and see actually what happened in this case. So um, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you'd like to see more, and please comment below if you have any requests or any ideas of videos you'd like to see. Other than that, I'll see you guys next week.